wherever wow, you are, to this? Sorry, guys, you on can. YouTube. Yeah. Uh -huh. Wow. That's okay. Our YouTube stick got like very messed up. But yes, we're back. <laughs> um, everyone can complain about is landlords. Either. Wait, well, we're already jumping in. This is we're the class. We're jumping in. This well, is the class. Okay, the I class. like it. Okay. No, this is actually, this is not the class. This is complaining about landlords. Because I feel like everyone has a story about a terrible landlord. And even if the landlord isn't terrible, something absolutely crazy that has happened. But to be fair, we've had some really nice landlords too. No, here, take that one. Yeah, and then give me that one. Okay, mom. This is... <laughs> Coffee juggling. Thank you. We've had much. some good landlords too. I don't want to hate on landlords collectively. This is true. And I think that for every story that we have about a not ideal landlord, I'm sure that our landlords have terrible stories about renters. About and that's us. what I mean is that, like, this is the kind of story that bridges generations and everyone's experience is that you can both complain about being a renter. But presumably, you can also complain about being a landlord, right? Sure, fair enough. So you're saying if you are not landowning, you have to rent <laughs> a property, and this can create its own sort of trials and tribulations. Absolutely. And um, the first time that I ever um, rented an apartment abroad was in Turkey. And I rented an apartment from a woman... Uh, a friend and I rented an apartment from a woman who did not speak English, and my friend and I did not speak Turkish. We just arrived in Turkey. Um, but we sort of figured out renting from this very, very nice woman who seemed very friendly and very helpful, getting us all set up, and the house was furnished, and it was a really, really nice place. We thought it was going to be a really good setup. And, you know, we started work, we were teaching, we were gone through the day, but we'd come home in the evening, and... Uh, we didn't really notice anything, but the, the apartment always seemed like things were being moved around. But because uh, the woman I was renting with, like we weren't really, we just sort of thought it was each other. And we started to realize that in fact, it was the landlord who would come in every day and clean the apartment, which she thought was like the nicest thing that someone could do. And my friend and I felt like it was a step too far. <laughs> in terms of like personal boundaries and appropriate landlord renter behavior right does that seem like i think that if far? your problem is that your landlord clean your property too frequently you have not lived i don't i don't accept that as a complaint My, the very is that first, not legitimate gripe of the very a, a landlord the very first apartment that i rented uh -huh. was when i was a student in coimbra portugal uh -huh. and this is a, was pre-Airbnb. Mm. So you had to walk around and find people's <laughs> notices. Yes. And these weren't evil landlords necessarily. These no, were these like, are just people who are renting out Yeah, yeah, house. exactly. Yeah. Their own homes. It's yeah. not like they've bought up properties. However, I so lucked out that I ended up in an apartment where I was in bed. Mm. So there's that first day when you're going to sleep and you're kind of like on edge because there's always going to be something in your apartment <laughs> that's not working, but you don't yes. know what it's going to be yet. It's no going to be something, yeah. but it's going to be a surprise problem. So I got into the day and I thought everything's working, the water's working, heat's working, there's no creepy mm -hmm. people, etc. <laughs> and then I lay in bed and I suddenly heard Oh no. <laughs> and then the next night I heard and I thought maybe I have a poltergeist who's just eating. <laughs> and then I realized where is that sound coming from? Uh-huh. And I started investigating where is the sound coming from? Mm -hmm. And then I realized that the beam of the uh like, like roof, the ceiling the beam, ceiling yeah. beam was infested <gasps> with termites and so what i was hearing at night was termites, <laughs> termites eating, away eating away the ceiling above my head <laughs> so there you go enough stories wow. there you go. so <laughs> yes. too much cleaning too my much hat cleaning. <laughs> yeah, no it was i know intrusion of privacy okay intrusion I understand of privacy that. yes now the reason that um that I start with this is because everyone has a story about a rental experience, especially during COVID. Can I, can yes. I, I want to let you start this, but if you're yes. going to like throw shade, throw shade on the university housing units. Oh, I was gathering up a ball oh, you're of gonna shade. Get there? I was, okay, cause like, I was 
that's that's where you want to throw shade because every week at Brooks, the very first week, and this is going to be like my last, like, I'm going to let you start, but every week at Brooks, in the first week, my students would come to me mm -hmm. and they would be really genuinely, like, struggling. Yeah. And I always knew what it was. I always knew what it was. <laughs> it was always that something had collapsed in their student housing, whether it was the mm -hmm. ceiling or their fridge or the door. Mm -hmm. And so these, these relatively young students had, I was going to call you guys kids, had just <laughs> moved into their own property and do to no fault of their own they had a terrible experience mm -hmm. and this happened every single semester because those housing units are not meant to you last. always know what it's yeah. going to be yeah, the one be housing yeah. the person this does not apply to is the person who fell down the stairs drunk and smashed the, <laughs> their foot into the door of their neighbor you know who you are okay, okay let's no start. shaming no no rent shaming. no shade throwing no apartment shaming well what's um What's interesting about rent is it's one of those ubiquitous economic experiences that you think must there must be a theory of rent in economics. And in fact, you would be right. There is a theory of rent. But mainstream economists are quick to say, well, the experience of being a renter isn't technically rent. So what you think of as rent isn't actually rent. And we have to kind of back up to think about what economists mean when they talk about an economic theory of rent. And of mm -hmm. course, mainstream economics being the traditionalists that they are, like to go back to Adam Smith because Adam mm -hmm. Smith is sort of the originator of economic theory in their mind. And Adam Smith was confronted with a puzzle. He said, income is generated, wealth is generated, but where does wealth actually come from? Where does this income come from? Is it's a it question I've often asked created myself. out of nothing? Or is it merely transferred from others? Or is it something that's earned and paid based on labor or hours worked or projects completed or I don't know, number of coffees poured or what have you. I don't think Adam Smith was knew about coffee. Maybe he did. Maybe he did. Anyway, that's for a different class. So income, Adam Smith said, is composed of three things. First, there's wages, which goes to pay people who produce and make things. Secondly, there is profit which is the excess resources that you earn based on your economic activity to reward your hard work. And thirdly, there is rent, which is the payment that you receive by dint of simply having access to the resources that give you profit. Right. Okay. So <clears throat> can we go over those three again for people taking notes? Yeah. So first is. So income as income. a category, income as a total category is composed of wages, which we're actually not going to talk about in this okay. class. So we wages. don't have to worry about wages at okay. the moment. Nobody um, getting paid here. <laughs> There's two categories, let's say. There is profit, which is the money that you receive okay. for your work. Uh -huh. And there are rents, which is money you also receive, but it's not something that is variable due to market forces. Now, this is really, really important. This is the distinguishing factor between rent and profit. Profit is affected by market forces, i.e. competition through competition and trying to uh, have more efficient manufacturing or, you know, paying your workers less or trying to source the goods cheaper or accelerating manufacturing or what have you. Celebrity endorsements. A celebrity endorsements. No, not celebrity endorsements. Really? That's not part of profit? Um, sorry. I, I, okay, sorry. No, that's an interesting question. No, no, I don't want to be the, the <laughs> class clown. I'm not the class clown. Not again. Not again, Mrs. Applebee's. <laughs> the interlocutor is not the class clown. Although you, you, you tread the line very carefully. I think I won't go from being interlocutor to worse translocutor. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm not just coming in between. It's just running through the entire thing. <laughs> so, profit is something that is affected based on market forces, which of course Adam Smith loved. He thought that this was. This was the market working perfectly. People who worked harder would earn more profit. Right. And rent was just if you were lucky. Because at the time, the biggest drivers in economic growth 
was still in agriculture. And so for these economists, they were really interested in who had the best quality agricultural land. And that is where classical economics just hit an absolute dead end. So David, uh, Adam Smith and David Ricardo are the two classical economists who are sort of associated with this classical theory of rent. And then the theory of rent just totally what? vanishes. Is rent here related to feudalism, to your renting the land to till it or? Rent is related to the notion that there are some resources right. which you don't necessarily uh, pay for. You right. might inherit, for example. So that's why it's related to yeah. land, but it is also related to land holdings and land owners who would rent out the land to people who would work the land. So it's not so much related to feudalism. Mm. It's more related to what happens when more when there is a limited amount of high quality land. Right. And there's only so much that you can do with poor quality land. <laughs> it's funny because um and I don't want to take you on a whole thing here, but like in communal living projects. Mm -hmm. Um, which is not communism, mm -hmm. let's be fair. I mean, <laughs> communism isn't the idea that you go to upstate New York <laughs> and you sort of have a homestead. Mm -hmm. But a lot of those communal living projects mm -hmm. have a rent-related system where you pay rent, but instead of paying rent to one holder, rent holder, mm -hmm. rentier, you pay it into the communal fund, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. it were. So you're paying into the participation of the community, right? which is kind of a fun idea. Yeah, and that raises a really important point because both Adam Smith and David Ricardo and subsequently Marx were all really upset about rentiers. So the person who rents something is the renter. If you uh, don't own your house, but rather rent it, you are a renter, R-E-N-T-E-R. -E right. But the person who owns the assets is called the rentier, R-E-N-T-I-E-R. It's funny that it's not the rentier and the rentee. Yes. Right? <laughs> I feel like we should fix this. Yeah, I don't know what the entomology is, but... <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so rentier? the rentier is the person who rents out something. Exactly. They're the ones who not just own the asset, but they own monopoly control of the asset, which means your landlord can't rent out your apartment to five different people. Now, isn't the counter argument here mm -hmm. that it's better to rent out an apartment than to have it be empty? Just playing devil's advocate here for a moment. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so uh, in that sense, I actually wanted to introduce mm -hmm. a statistic. All right. Which you might find interesting. Can we? We need like a little like a musical element here <laughs> like for statistic, like statistic. <laughs> This really surprised me when I first heard it, and I went back and double-checked it because I wanted to make sure that I had it right. Um, and this was, I think, even uh, higher during uh, b prior to the pandemic, but even now during the pandemic in uh. the Bay Area, which is San Francisco, Oakland, Bay Area of California, where housing prices are extremely high, but even in Oakland, where historically that had not been the case. Where shirt sleeves are optional. <laughs> Sorry. For every mm. unhoused person, okay. that is for every person who does not have access to, does not live in an apartment. Right. So they may be living in a motel, they may be living in a car, they may be living with friends or family, they don't have they don't have a home, they're unhoused. For every unhoused person, there are four to five mm. empty residential units. Right, yeah. Okay, so what this says is that the problem of being unhoused, homelessness, precarious housing is not an issue of, is there enough housing? Scarcity, yeah. Right, it's not an issue of scarcity. It's an issue of a dysfunctional market. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get I'm going to yeah, get no, to no, that I think later. That's a really good... But this is a really important statistic because we often see the problem of homelessness and people being unhoused as there aren't enough homes. When in fact, what rent does is it skews the economy in a way that economists don't like to acknowledge, which is part of the reason that the theory of rent just absolutely went dormant. I mean, it wasn't mm. something that was what? that was re widely researched or talked about in economics. I mean, after David Ricardo talked about 
farmers and good quality land, poor quality land. The issue of rent absolutely disappeared. But this is crazy because everyone rents stuff. Like renting things is just part of our capitalist economy. Yeah. Are we, yeah, does that relate to leasing as well? Yeah. Because, because, okay, anyway, that's I'm not going to guess. That's sort of like a. I really like your statistic. Synonym. And one of my envies, one of the things that I'm envious of, mm-hmm. of you teaching political economy, is that you can use statistics. Whereas when I teach philosophy, I don't really have that opportunity. Mm. And we. It was funny because as our account grows, we're sort of approached by more people who are interested mm-hmm. in, like, uh, sponsoring us and stuff. Mm-hmm. I feel like we should make your statistics. That should be the sponsorship. We should say, like, <laughs> this statistic <laughs> was brought to you by Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> well, I should say <clears throat> this statistic was, in fact, brought to you by yeah. Moms for Housing, I think is the name of the group of oh, women I remember that. Yeah, in yeah. Oakland who actually occupied empty housing because their point is look we're mothers we want to have a place where our kids can be safe we want to have a little bit of stability no one is living in this house furthermore by having people in that house you don't i mean you're able to maintain it better by having someone live there you can be sure that people aren't breaking into it they're not vandalizing it also houses that are just sitting empty that you know the water isn't being run that the heating isn't and there isn't air circulation etc is actually really bad for a home so it's better to have people in the house than to have the house sit empty well, this is a whole nother can of worms, but mm-hmm. that's also the whole industry of getting people who are precarious or homeless to mm-hmm. live in houses temporarily yeah. so that they don't get taken over by other people. Mm-hmm. And then not allowing those people to live in those homes. They just right. have to sleep on the floor on like a plastic mat mm-hmm. and then have to relocate as soon as the realtor wants to show off that house. That's like a huge uh, like industry behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. It's really kind of perverse. But I think anyone who's tried to live in a big city really under i mean or any place where housing is especially tight understands how difficult it can be to find housing of course because the problem isn't is there a house the problem is is there housing that is in your price range and so what we have is a mismatch between people's incomes and their resources available for housing right and what landlords want to charge is part of the reason that universal basic income is really a key aspect of this analysis. So what we have is a phenomenon, rent, which describes the breakdown of economics. Because we said profit was would uh, fluctuate in response to market exchange. But rent doesn't. Rent is something that's purely fixed, in part because it's access to a monopoly good, which means that no one else can access it. So a really good sort of classic example is a patent. So let's say a medical company makes a discovery of a new medicine and they file a patent for it, which means that no other company can manufacture that medicine. The hangover cure. <laughs> the hangover this cure. Gonna... This is the elusive, yeah, why, why aren't researchers working on the hangover cure and having a prescription hangover cure? So let's say a pharmaceutical, a pharmaceutical company manufactures the hangover cure. They're so excited. They file a patent because they don't want anyone else to profit from it or to make money from it, I should say. Then they go out, they market it, they manufacture it, they sell it, they promote it, they do all of these things. And it's um, the more they're able to sell at lower production costs, that increases their profit, right? Because we said that profit is something that's affected by, um, by market forces. So let's say during spring break, when all of the college students are out drinking and they really want a hangover cure, that's when, let's say, their profit goes up because there's more demand for it, right? So we see that profit is something that's really responsive to market forces. If there were a hangover cure, I feel like the um, uh, liquor industry would be all over it, though. You could basically get, like, a bottle of booze plus the hangover cure. (laughs) It's like when you go into uh, basketball stadiums now, Mm -hmm. they're advertising the ticket sales Mm -hmm. plus a COVID test. You know what I mean? Here's the thing that will make you sick, and here's the thing that we think will not make you sick. Okay. <laughs> we'll tell you whether or not you're sick. Yeah. Right. But notice, what's significant about this is not just the profit of the pharmaceutical company that's making this hangover cure. Right. 
part of their profit is driven by the fact that no one else can make this. They're the only company that can supply this. So it's not as though, so rent doesn't mean what they pay for the patent. Rent doesn't quite mean what they're able to charge. I mean, rent really describes what they're able to charge because no one else is making the same thing. Yeah, exclusivity. It's, an effect, it's exclusivity. It's an effective monopoly on this hangover cure. Okay. Yes. Um, are we for or against patents? Well, patents are really interesting because I think that patents is actually where, where um, traditional economics short circuits. Okay. Because the argument is... We need patent protection because otherwise there won't be innovation. We won't have entrepreneurship if people aren't rewarded for their economic yeah. activity. So we need some incentive for people to be creative and to develop new technology, etc. And we reward them through patents. But what happens is once these patents are granted, then we have a market inefficiency where the monopoly is um, creating rent and rent seeking behavior. So, but so puts, rents uh, uh, are both really good in economics, but also really bad in economics. If yeah. you look at political economy and the history of capitalism as mm -hmm. being the guarantee and protection of private property, mm. the state increasingly becoming the guarantor of the protection and legislation of private property yeah. through legislation, mm -hmm. is a patent a form of protecting private property as well? That's a really, really good question. And that's a point I want to get to in a little bit. But I okay. want to talk a little bit more about patents. Because you know, when you say that's a really good question, it makes me feel really like happy inside. I feel like I become a student again. You know what I mean? Like, if you're ever a teacher, make sure to tell your students that they have good questions. Yes. Like, it's funny, that feeling never... Um, it used to be that there wasn't... Um, governments didn't have patent protection. And so what they would, what governments did is they would very, very jealously guard any secret technology, technology. Okay. And it was considered a state secret. So a big one was um, for the manufacture of textiles and spinning machines. And there are stories throughout history of uh, industrial saboteurs going to factories and trying to figure out how spinning machines worked and mm -hmm. then traveling to a different country to set up those machines because they were considered a national project. They weren't yeah. even like a market project. Like fighter planes in World War II. Exactly. So Thomas Jefferson, who was um, one of the, considered the sort of founding fathers of the United States and... Um, <laughs> Is considered. is considered. I like that there's like some people are like, Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> totally not a founding father. <laughs> I well, that. I feel like founding fathers is such a like, it's such a cliche Hashtag so-called founding father. <laughs> such a cliche <laughs> phrase. Thomas Jefferson, who was sort of the ideological opposite of um, Alexander Hamilton, was really opposed to patents because he said that charging rents is really problematic and is actually detrimental to economic growth. And at the time, patents sure. were only valid for about 15 years. Do you How long are they valid now? Do you want to guess? 90. You're pretty close. It's 50 years, but uh, it depends on, it depends on, um, what the property is. It's usually, so if it's art or music or artists, it's usually the lifetime of the artist. But of course, Walt Disney has passed away, but Disney Corporation is sort of considered the zombie version, mm. the perpetually alive spirit of Walt Disney. Right. And so those patents live on. Um, that's part of the reason the opera music is so ubiquitous in cartoons, especially older cartoons, mm -hmm. is because that music wasn't patented. That there wasn't an existing copyright for that music um, because those composers had passed away. So what we've seen is not just the expansion in length of how long a copyright is valid for, but also the number of patents has absolutely exploded. And yet, Economic innovation hasn't really grown at the same pace. And there's some interesting research. And of course, I say interesting because I find it interesting. It's very dry and probably quite boring about how productivity and innovation is measured in an economy. And economists who study this say there's been an explosion in the number of patents, but there hasn't been a corresponding rise in growth of new technology. 
And yeah, I'll give like, you, where's yeah. that hoverboard I was promised? Well, I'll give you an example. Like, uh, when you look at IT firms, which are effective monopolies, like, my, let's be honest, Microsoft is basically a monopoly on office software and technology. And when they bought Skype, it's not like they made Skype a lot better. They made Skype a lot worse and made it so that you had to use Microsoft so that you didn't really have a choice. It locked you into a system. It didn't necessarily take what had been innovative and expand on it and improve on it. And that's one of the criticisms about not just technological um, acquirings is that it doesn't create growth. It's used as a, as a tool to limit competition and to increase monopoly growth. Does that make sense? Yeah. Although strictly speaking, it's not a monopoly, is it? It's just a de facto standard. It was, and that's why I say it's kind of like an effective right, yeah. monopoly or quasi-monopoly. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So there are other examples of rent. Uh, a big one is, of course, utilities. And there was a story a few months ago, of course, in Texas and in the South that had unprecedentedly low temperatures and utility providers struggled to... Wait, you're talking about the snowstorm? Yeah, I'm talking about the snowstorm and the freezing temperatures in Texas and the South. And what made Texas kind of interesting was that not only is their utility company a monopoly like most other utilities but the way that it's operated is that it buys is that it's its own regional territorial utility and it buys its energy on the futures market so it has a different purchasing structure than other utilities okay and um what it and the idea rem, keep in mind that the idea behind profits is this market logic which is that pr, that that competition will drive down prices it'll increase efficiency and as people are responsive to prices if the prices rise then people redu will reduce their consumption of that good but utilities it's not like, you, you know, it got choice. really cold. Yeah, you don't have a choice. It got really cold. It's not like people are going to say, oh, suddenly electricity has gotten really expensive. I'm going to turn off the heat. No, the reason that they're needing so much electricity is because the temperature got really cold for everyone. More than that, uh, you have to look at the time period over which people are price sensitive. So if I go, um, I mean, people in the United States are most sensitive to the price that you see everywhere, which is the price of gasoline. Gasoline is like advertised on every street corner. Every, as a European, this yeah. like drives me crazy that yes. people talk about gasoline as if it's just this like, you're talking about the weather. Yeah. Because I, that, that is not a unit of measurement that makes any sense to me. As, as, yeah. Yeah. And part of it is because the price of gasoline affects so many other goods. Well, so I that's imagine... somewhere that people are really price sensitive. But utilities, you're always looking at the previous month. You're not saying, oh, my usage now, this is what I'm being charged right, right now at this moment. So what I'm suggesting is that utilities are not a good market for price sensitivity. And because they're a form of rent, that's why market forces don't work particularly well. Yeah. It seems to me that what uh, utilities have in common with the price of gasoline, which they also have in common with like public fare transport mm -hmm prices let's say in brazil for example we have the free fare movement protests mm -hmm. that exploded because the price of a metro ticket went up by mm -hmm. like 80 cents or something right. is that all of those what they have in common is that they're fairly universal mm -hmm. and because there's yeah. nobody who doesn't use heat right i mean there's some people who have like kerosene whatever or mm -hmm. something like this but like overall it's something that we all tap into so right. it, it seems like it's a it's a pretty good way to measure economic trends mm, because mm -hmm. there's so few people who opt out of it. Yeah. Well, and it's also, I mean, I don't know if utilities are part of inflation measurements. It's funny because the word utility for me implies that it's something that would be a public service, like a part of the welfare state, because for something to be mm -hmm. like a utility is something that's supposed to be helpful in like it's something that you utilize yeah 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 and there's a lot of different structure for utilities um actually our electricity utility where we live is operated as a co-op really yeah hmm. so they take turns cranking the 
<laughs> yeah. The wheel. You're turning. You're scheduled next week. <laughs> uh, no. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be on like the hamster wheel for my whole neighborhood. I'm gonna be on the hamster wheel generating like electricity. Yeah. So utilities are really interesting because you're right. They do imply this sort of like there's something that everyone needs, but they are also oftentimes run as a business for yeah. profit, and this is especially true in the United Kingdom. And one of the books on the reading list, or a couple of the books that I refer to, talks about how what the um, what the government is doing is effectively using private providers of public goods, like utilities. Mm -hmm. And so it's taking something that is a rent and trying to turn it into a profit-based business. And so it's trying to extract additional profit from something that is purely a monopoly. And this is economically inefficient because what's happened is these companies don't want to invest in the infrastructure. The infrastructure falls apart. It becomes more expensive to operate. Meanwhile, the prices are rising without uh, equivalent improvements in service. So Thames water constantly being fined for dumping raw sewage into the River Thames or... Thames water being one of the major UK water, water, provider, yeah. water providers. And this is part of the reason that the UK, which receives an overabundance of rain, to be honest, is facing water shortages. Like it's just it's preposterous. Anyway, I don't well, want to. I don't want to. Yeah, I mean, get too much at some point, I'm that. imagining you're going to talk about um, like the railway system and stuff like that. Yeah, that's another subway. good. That's another good one. So someone has made the really important point that monopolies can be a good thing, and this is where I would argue that we need state monopolies. The railroads are absolutely a good example of. Um, where monopolies can be really effective. Monopolies can be effective when there's a high cost to putting in the infrastructure. Trains, obviously a really good example. And it doesn't make sense to have parallel competing systems because if you have two train companies, you're doubling up the amount of infrastructure that needs to be put in. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I interrupt very briefly? Yes. Before we get in stuck on like a, an argument here. Mm -hmm. A state monopoly is a misnomer mm. because a state monopoly doesn't function like a private monopoly. It's not like one, you either have a state monopoly or a private monopoly. Mm -hmm. Technically for me, there is no such thing as a state monopoly mm. because a state can't, in my mind, can't have a monopoly over something. No? No, I mean, it's an interesting question. Um, we could say, I mean, the primary state monopoly is over the use of force. So yeah, yeah, sure. police officers and the military. But what we're seeing is the rise in private security, private security forces, private military, right. private militia, that. uh -huh. and that's outsourcing. Exactly. Yeah. So that's a really, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like here is the idea that like, if we say that the state starts with a certain monopoly as mm -hmm. a baseline mm -hmm. of how it should be, mm -hmm. and then it slowly becomes outsourced mm -hmm. to the point where one of those outsourced groups takes over monopoly, yeah. that's a monopoly. But mm -hmm. to me, like, state control here isn't necessarily a monopoly right because otherwise people hear state monopoly and they immediately think like i don't know you're going to take over the healthcare system and suddenly people are going to be dying everywhere like right. you know what i mean part of it is because in economics the the let's say the ideology right because i do think that it's an ideology so suggests that the only way to effectively provide services is through market competition. Yeah. And so the inefficient ones will go out of business and they'll lose business and the better businesses will succeed. Yeah, and that, the problem this... with a monopoly is that there isn't competition. But I would suggest that in, and I am gonna call it a state monopoly because mm -hmm. I mean, I do think that that's what right. it is. The idea is that in a democracy, if services are not being well run, then those politicians who are responsible for maintaining them will be removed from office. I mean, it's interesting, right? Because you and I grew up in an era in which the idea was that the the smaller you could make government and mm -hmm. the more that you brought private, uh, let's, they call themselves like solutions yeah. into <laughs> government, you'd be able to be much more efficient. Mm -hmm. And I think the opposite has proven true is that by creating financial incentives for people to create problems that don't exist, mm -hmm. that they can offer you expensive solutions to, that's how we've fractured government into a million pointless exercises. Yeah. And it's funny because like every once in a while someone will say like, oh, look at this government website. It's so bad. Mm -hmm. See, government can't do anything. <laughs> and you're like, exactly, because we outsourced every little part mm -hmm. to all these little shitty companies. Yeah, yeah. And, and I had a friend actually who um, 
he was studying management mm -hmm. while I was studying uh, Portuguese. Mm -hmm. And he was really, really into that. This whole idea, like, we can be way more effective if we basically just break everything and down. And just privatize everything. Yeah, and all that. Mm -hmm. And it was funny for me because I kind of, this is totally anecdotal. Like, this isn't even an argument. but And, and it's a straw man anecdote <laughs> because nobody knows this person. But, and I'll admit to that. Um, but the thing is, <laughs> this fictional friend, so-called friend. <laughs> here's a friend who proves my point. Um, but basically, it was funny, like, watching him go through that process of, mm -hmm. of realizing that that was an ideology of mm. his particular course. Yeah. And that his own experience of working for those companies as an intern was yeah. like, we're not actually being more efficient. We've just created more jobs, as it exactly. were. And it's funny because we always accuse the state of being like this massively wasteful job mm -hmm. creating program when it's exactly the other way around. We mm -hmm. create an enormous amount of so-called bullshit jobs mm -hmm. that are unnecessary because we've convinced ourselves that we can outsource every single thing mm -hmm. that wouldn't be that hard to do within the state yes. as such. And I'm saying that the reason for this split absolutely goes back to the distinction that Adam Smith made okay. that echoes throughout classical economics, including Marx, is that there is a distinction between profit and rent. Okay. And so much focus in economics is purely about profit, saying if we have economic incentives of competition and free market and laissez-faire, and if government just gets out of the way and lets the businessmen do their thing, then we're gonna have the best economy, we're gonna have the best products, we're gonna have the most highly functioning economy. I mean, 200 years plus of economics focused purely on how can we maximize profit? How can we maximize growth? How can we improve the economy? How can we have more competition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the notion of rent absolutely fell by the wayside until it was resurrected in a way that I find wildly perverse, but still really funny, in something called the Tulloch Paradox. And if you're interested, this author spells his name T-U-L-L-O-C-K. And Tulloch was really interested in... Can I just do a very quick plug? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. If you want to read more about the Tulloch Paradox, paradox mm -hmm. and learn how to spell the Tulloch Paradox, <laughs> you can download Jeneline's lecture notes, yes. which she wrote yesterday. Yes. And if you are a patron, you have access to those. So, plug... Go to www.patreon.com dash Jenlene and Julian to download Jenlene's lecture notes. This Sorry, is like a little, a little advertisement that we're putting Thanks. in here, which is better than doing somebody else's advertisement. <laughs> Says the man wearing the... I will... As though she needs advertising. She does... No, no, she does not need advertising. <laughs> She's... She needs to be worshipped by everybody. I get that. I'm, I'm with that. that. That is a deity I can abide by. This is an example of rent. Right here. I know. Right here. Any kind of any kind of patent, any kind of copyright, branding. any kind of branding, all of that is rent. And it's a really, really fascinating thing. So I want to make sure that I do this transition for in people, a way. For people on Instagram, sensible. this makes no sense though, what you're what you're accusing me of here. <laughs> that's okay, we're gonna do I sense a way. little bit of jealousy here? A it's little my bit shirt. of this is actually a Jenlene shirt, that's true. This is Jenlene's It looks pretty good on you though. Right? Yeah. I think I'm kind of pulling it off. <laughs> okay. So All right. this. So what we said is that rent is a big problem for economics. How do they resolve this? Because rent is something that's not necessarily a function of market forces. It requires strong intervention by the government to protect patents and copyrights, but also to enforce tax subsidies, to run utilities, to regulate utilities. Right. Um, the way that tax breaks are structured, all of that stuff is our examples and forms of rent. Okay, so not just living in a house. That's really important. Yeah, it's not, there. rent is not about living in a house. That's the way we talk about it, but that's not really what economic okay. rent is. That's okay. <clears throat> that's really important. So Tolek says, you know, rent seeking behavior, if we understand rent seeking behavior or trying to maximize rent, okay. it's increasing the share of someone's wealth especially by manipul manipulating public policy or economic conditions, especially by subsidies, tariffs, or making a product artificially scarce. And Tulloch said, is corruption an mm. example of rent-seeking behavior? And he said, absolutely. He mm. said that the state is, um, 
by by the fact that it is creating regulations, um, corporate entities can lobby the government, which is sort of the polite term for corruption. Wait, to... wait, wait, wait. Lobbying is corruption? Lobbying is... Um, let's say, uh, let's, I don't want to get into it. Okay, I don't want to get too far into this. We can do this, this in like the, the special after class thing. <laughs> yeah. But I, I actually am a, this is, I know it's goes against everything that we're supposed to say, but I'm like a slight apologist for lobbying mm-hmm. because I feel like lobbying has also brought us good things when it's been done correctly. Yeah, absolutely. I think lobbying can be really helpful, but it's undeniable that the amount of money spent on lobbying, and lobbying isn't just someone going to a politician's office. Yeah, yeah. It's taking a politician out for a meal. It's helping uh, organize fundraisers for politicians. It's helping do publicity and even writing legislation for legislators. So my point is that what a company can benefit, let's say from a tax break, could be millions of dollars. And what they pay in lobbying is a tiny, tiny fraction of that. And if we say that tax breaks are a form of um, rent-seeking behavior, right. then in a way the market facilitates this. And Tulloch's paradox is to say, why don't more companies engage in lobbying? And why is lobbying effectively so cheap? Why is it so cheap to participate in politics? Now, Tulloch was writing this, I think, in the, about the 80s, when political participation was relatively, let's say, cheap. And as we've seen in the United States, without regulation over campaign finance, the costs of elections have absolutely exploded. Do you know where lobbying and like physical rent meet up in hmm. the perfect marriage? Is the Venn diagram? Yeah, of... it's people booking rooms in the Trump Hotel <laughs> in order to get favors for their country. That is the perfect culmination of like actual rent versus rent seeking behavior. Yes. So rent raises a really interesting paradox for talking about what is capitalism. Are we saying rent is just a natural outcome of economic and capital activity that it's just something that's purely unavoidable can we very yeah can we just define rent in this sense very quickly Mm -hmm. rent is payment right to an owner of a factor of production right in excess of the cost needed to bring that factor into production payment to an owner of a factor of production yeah in excess to the costs needed to bring that factor into production yeah so it's creating surplus value it's creating surplus surplus value and this is how marx talked about rent is marx said surplus value is what the worker produces in the difference between labor hours and the cost of producing something okay but for marx rent is something that's even beyond the surplus value it's like hyper surplus value and i was trying to find the translation of it and i couldn't find it so, okay, so I don't, I'm sorry, I know that I'm talking no, no. here, but I like, I'm starting to get a bit abstract in my head. So that is what rent is. So, however, why is that not a good thing? Doesn't it seem like value created from nothing? Who pays the cost here? The problem is that the value, it doesn't add value. Okay, it just adds price. Imagine, imagine that you, and this is where go, and this is why landlord um, complaining about your landlord is for me the basis of understanding rent. Because the problem with landlords is they don't have an incentive right. to improve the house. If your landlord starts fixing up your apartment, you know that your landlord is about to raise the rent, or he's getting ready to kick you out. Right. Like that is thing. the only reason that a it's landlord like is going you, to improve the like, property, and that. That's the pro. I mean, that's one of the many problems with rent. It's monopolistic. It doesn't um, incentivize improvement. It doesn't incentivize investment. It doesn't contribute to growth. It exacerbates inequality. Like these are all problems of rent. And the fundamental question like is: <laughs> the fundamental hu- question is, is rent? just a natural thing that happens under capitalism and we just have to accept it as being part of the way capitalism operates or is this somehow an aberration of capitalism is this something where capitalism has gone wrong what's the 
what's the alternative in this case? And I don't mean to be like this person, but no, like, that's a really good but question. Because so <laughs> far you've mentioned some things about rent that seem bad, mm -hmm. which is there's no incentive to create a high standard of goods. Mm -hmm. There's a, a tendency towards monopoly. Right. There's a, a, a driver of inequality mm -hmm. where we create uh, value structures that only benefit people who are already wealthy. All right. that I understand. Yeah. And what are we saying? Is this something where the, the good outweighs the bad or? No, it's a, it's a good question. So the, and that's why I say the question is really, are you, it, it, do you see rent and rent seeking behavior as something is a natural outgrowth of capitalism, in which case that's just the way it is and we have to accept it? Or is it an aberration that we can in some way reform? So I would suggest that by now the Austrian and mainstream uh, perspective says the government is the problem. This is the Tullock's paradox. They say the government is the problem and if only the government would stop incentivizing certain kinds of behavior through patents, um, tax subsidies, um, tariffs, right. etc., then there wouldn't be any other monopoly control. But what this avoids is that the entire reason that we have those incentives and protections is to protect innovators and entrepreneurs. So this is where that economics thinking absolutely short circuits because they say on the one hand, we need rewards for entrepreneurs and innovators. But on the other hand, they say, oh no, those rewards, those are actually leading to economic inefficiency. So that's the short circuiting. I think that the best way to deal with this issue is to reduce the rewards of rent. I mentioned the patent protection. Um, so you mean regulation? I mean more regulation or different regulation. So you and, and I this had a... Is, and this is, sorry, this is the argument that Guy Standing makes, who's the other, one of the other um, critical thinkers. How's that a real name, Guy Standing? It's a great name. It's like woman sitting. <laughs> it's a great name. Um, yeah, I wish that guy were short for something longer, but... Uh, I think it's actually a French name, isn't it? Probably. Yeah, yeah, it's Guy de... I used to have a friend whose name was like Guy de Vickersloot or something <laughs> like this, yeah. So he says, you know, um, Austrian and mainstream economics is saying that government rents are the problem, but it's actually corporations that have manipulated the system of rents in their benefit. Right. Okay. And he says they have done this by expanding the use of patents. And there's something called patent trolling, which I think is a great phrase, whereby companies buy up patents, again, not because they want to use and innovate them, which is what the sort of optimistic economist says uh, corporations should do with patents, but rather to use those patents as a way to sue other companies saying, you're yeah. using my patent. I'm going to bring a lawsuit against you and I'm going to get money from you. And this is a huge problem in the United States because patents are no longer being used as a way to protect people's ideas and inner innovation, but rather as a cudgel to beat down other companies and try and extract money from them. So, I mean, that's part of the reason I think that this, that the issue of rent has really been either ignored by mainstream economics, as I said, after Smith and Ricardo, it essentially disappeared until the 1980s, because it does create that problem of, you know, if you really think that the market can resolve everything, then how do you explain the rise of monopolies and the more recent development of really problematic monopolies that are limiting, um, economic competition it seems to me that there's something emancipatory about the idea of rent yeah in its purest form mm -hmm. in the same way that for libertarianism in its purest form libertarianism comes oddly close to communism mm. however from my own experience and from the very very limited understanding that i have of what you're talking about it seems to me that if we have a rent relationship mm -hmm. we can either prioritize the rentee mm -hmm. or the rentier, mm. the person who is renting out or the person who is benefiting from those goods. Yeah. And my experience, for example, in the UK housing market mm -hmm. is that the laws, including the municipal laws, are specifically structured to protect the interests of the rentee. In other mm. words, the la the property holder, mm -hmm. the renter, and the renter. And this, no, no, no. The renter is the person who's renting, the renting out person. The rentier is the person who owns the property. Rentier. Yeah, yeah. rentier. Okay. And that 
the laws, both municipal and on the national level, are mm -hmm. designed to favor that person, mm -hmm. which comes at the cost of the user right. or the consumer, as mm -hmm. it were. Mm -hmm. And so it is about building in consumer protections mm -hmm that allow you, for example, not to be evicted too easily and stuff yeah. like this. So it seems to me that, and maybe I just because I don't know about it, but I don't, that maybe perhaps rent itself is not inherently bad, yeah. but that we have, like you said, with lobbying, we have a system where government protects the interests of those people who are undermining the quality of rent. It's in part because they can use their first house's equity to get a down payment on a second house. So part of the distinction between ownership and renting is that it exacerbates the inequality between people who rely on debt and people who have assets well, and wealth. And it's funny, be sorry, I know that I'm interrupting mm -hmm. here, but I do think that it's important. I mean, sorry, first of all, for butting in, yeah. but I think that what you will probably address as we move forward is that our generation, mm -hmm. because I think that you and I can probably say that we are millennials, mm -hmm. are the rent generation. The generation in which for us, our parents were encouraged to become homeowners. Mm -hmm. And that we, A, did not necessarily have the option of owning a home, certainly not in the city. And that we are that generation where 50% of our income would go into rent. Mm -hmm. And that is a, when you look at the statistics, that's quite universally true yeah. for our generation. Mm -hmm. And so rent becomes both a condition of our participation in a global multicultural mm -hmm. exchange mm -hmm. of people living well in different places and taking easy jet and mm -hmm. all that stuff. And at the same time, it becomes this dead end mm -hmm. in a sense where the, the relative wealth of, of the, our parents' generation is brought into the coffers of other people mm -hmm. and there's because there's also relatively low uh, employability for our generation which i'm not just blaming on mm -hmm. the market mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. may also have to do with our lifestyle then leads to what's next mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i think that's a question that gen z is asking now also because gen z doesn't live quite as much in a rentier structure as you and i lived well and and i think it's becoming easier to be blind to how rentierism and rent-seeking behavior absolutely permeates our life. And that's why I wanted to push back right. a little bit about this notion of just looking at housing rent, because that's a way that's really intuitive and sort of easy to understand. Yeah. But what we're talking about is access to, to services, goods and services that are monopoly controlled. So I think uh, you're absolutely right. If we're looking at housing, it's about building more affordable and low income housing. Yeah, absolutely. That is absolutely key yeah. because, as I said, Duh. builders make more profit selling expensive houses to rich people. And they would rather have a house sit empty for three years waiting for a rich person to come along and buy it yeah. than rent it out in the meantime to someone who could afford to live there. So, require, and this is where government has to be active, it has to require affordable housing so, because there isn't an incentive if necessarily for it's important here to make a distinction between the united kingdom and the united states because mm -hmm. in the united kingdom there's a drive towards laws that basically say anytime you build a certain amount of houses no matter what residential area you have to also provide mm -hmm. some affordable housing which mm -hmm. is why you could live in the most expensive part of london and there'll be some houses that look relatively dilapidated in comparison mm -hmm. now that's never going to solve it to the point that municipalities like in London were literally mm -hmm. bussing people out of the city yeah. because they didn't want those poor people to live there mm -hmm. because it brings down the overall vibe. It's like, oh, we can't be a tourist attraction if we have people who don't look like they live in Notting Hill, etc. Now in the United States, mm -hmm. there's a different problem, which is the problem of segregation mm -hmm. is much more uh, like area specific than it is in the United Kingdom. Yeah. There is no instance in the United States hmm. where in a gated community you will find affordable housing where relatively poor people live in that gated community. Exactly. So this brings the problem, I know this is a rant, but like the ghettoization mm -hmm. of living standards in the United States where if you live in a nice neighborhood, you will literally never encounter someone mm -hmm. who does not live in a nice neighborhood. Yeah, and I think that what's really interesting about the pandemic is the way that it it has, um, it's really changed the way people see big cities and what it means to live in a big city and why that's attractive. Right. And it'll be interesting to see whether that, the degree to which that continues. Um, 
I well, mean, that's... I think that people, the big cities are always going to be attractive places for people to live. And the question is just going to be who is going to be living in those cities. That's one of those questions moving forward. If we talk about it generationally as well, mm, if we see mm-hmm. our parents' generation plus Gen X as being, uh, trying to have ownership of property right. towards our generation being a both rent participating and rent seeking generation, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. let's be fair, a lot of people also of our generation make money by mm-hmm. means of rent. Yeah. And then Gen Z may be moving into like the digital commons and yeah. figuring out how do I live and have access to things that are mm-hmm. happening strictly speaking online, yeah. such as what we're doing right now. Yeah, and someone raises a really good question about what what happens when what was affordable housing becomes unaffordable. Yeah. And that's absolutely that's absolutely an issue. And that's why making sure that sufficient low income housing is built to meet the the needs for that community. And so what what the study of rent suggests to us is that there are certain goods that are that are weakly related to the pricing of the market and utilities mm-hmm. is a classic mm-hmm. example we should not say oh we'll just keep raising the price of electricity or of heating or water to discourage people from using it and that's where uh the introduction of private providers of public utilities and public goods is so problematic mm-hmm. where the imposition of um, particular use taxes or um, tax breaks, tariffs, subsidies, etc., are market skewing. So we need to really reevaluate how those protections are brought, are 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 implemented and enforced. Um, so that's kind of the key takeaway: is that rent is one of those short circuits in economic thinking that really challenges our notion of how the market should function. Because we love, I mean, we love thinking about you know, for the capitalists, it's the entrepreneurial spirit, and you know, to be rewarded by for innovation by patent protection, actually creates its own kinds of limitations. And so how we respond to that is really important. So what may um, contribute to inflation that would make affordable housing unaffordable might be a universal basic income. I think that's still an idea worth pursuing. We can talk about that more in the clubhouse Um, because I think that there's a lot of permutations of universal basic income and how it's implemented that would be really interesting. Um, Nice. But that's it. Can I ask you one more thing before we wrap up? Mm -hmm. When you say that rent functions as a short circuit Mm -hmm. of economic thinking, Mm -hmm. is there any way that we can make, and I know this is preposterous as a philosopher for me to ask for something concrete, but what is particularly, what are the two nodes that are being short-circuited here? The two nodes are rent and profit. Profit is the market susceptible, uh, market adjusted income levels. Mm -hmm. And rent is just the fixed, you know, this is what you get because this is the only place that you can get this good or it's protected by the government. Or if you use it, you know, a lawsuit is going to be brought against you. Right. Okay. So if we want to be really silly, we could say that rent throws a wrench into market (laughs) economics. Absolutely. And that's part of the reason that mainstream economics really tries to either ignore rent or say that government is actually the problem. But I think that that this really misses the point about what's interesting about rent. Because for political economists, it's not just government either acting or not acting but it's about what governments do what the policies are that are implemented and we see the 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 erosion in um or the the growth in patent control and copyright as really being detrimental so as both the feminist in chief here and the (laughs) pessimist in chief i think we need to explore perhaps in the future uh, the biopolitics of rent seeking mm. behavior mm-hmm. where if you think about prostitution or sex work mm. being a form of using your own body as mm-hmm. a commodity in yeah. that sense and I wonder if that's increasingly going to become the standard is that we have become comfortable with commoditizing not just our experience as human beings through like sharing data and stuff yeah, like yeah. this but also simply access to ourselves and our bodies yeah for me that's about commodification that's not about okay rent. fair so yeah, yeah that's that's Maybe we'll do commodification next. That'd be fun. That'd be great. Anyway. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> I think like like I really there's a lot of things there that I learned that I hadn't mm-hmm. really thought about before. Mm-hmm. Good. 
All right. Happy to hear. Can we briefly plug our clubhouse party? Yes, absolutely. Do you want to do it? Sure. We're going to be yeah. moving over to Clubhouse, which we use as a um, as a audio only discussion of what we talked about. And if you, uh, we get we did a hundred invites, I think, for Clubhouse. Hundred sixty. Hundred and sixty. So we really want to thank you all for uh, passing on invites to Clubhouse because it's an invite only app, and we. That is monopoly control is to say you can only you can only join the clubhouse if you receive an invite. And we really were not super crazy about that. So we worked <laughs> with you I like guys. that this is an anti plug. <laughs> it's like instead of saying let's do this, you're like, here's why I don't want to. It's do a great this. platform, but we really wanted to bring as many of you guys into Clubhouse as we did, and we could only do it because you guys sent out invites to other people. So we thank you so clubhouse. much. Yeah, we gate crash Clubhouse. So we thank you so much for helping us expand the learning community on Clubhouse. We're going to use it as a way to just kind of talk a little bit about the, the lecture, ask questions, share horror stories of Pro your terrible landlords. Okay, I'm going to briefly jump in on this plug. Fix the plug. I'm going to fix this plug because <laughs> you forgot to mention the most important part is there's going to be a prize raffle. By the way, did yes. you know that if I type in the words prize raffle mm. into our Patreon, which I did, <laughs> a button comes up that says you're not allowed to say the word raffle <laughs> because apparently raffles are against the policy guidelines, community guidelines of Patreon. <laughs> because some people started Patreon specifically oh. for if you pay us, we'll create <laughs> prizes. So instead of a raffle, according to Patreon, we now have to call this a prize giveaway, not a raffle. I'm talking about like this, the What if the prize tip. giveaway is a raffle? So, uh, yes, we're all paying rent. We are we are paying rent on Clubhouse simply by means of like giving our voices to the Chinese. So <laughs> here's the plug. Yes. Right now, Jenlene and I are going to go over to Clubhouse. And you can find it at the learning community. At, at Sublime Hysteric. Yes. Jenlene's handle is at J-E-N-A-L-I-N-E. -E. At Jenlene, because Jenlene has such an <laughs> extravagant name that no one else has that handle. <laughs> so if you want to participate in our Clubhouse party, please head over to Clubhouse right now. Giving away a prize. Actually, not just a prize be giving away three prizes however if there's only three people then that doesn't work <laughs> so we would really really like you to hop on onto clubhouse right now in <laughs> fact while you are still here youtube people we're gonna go off youtube now <laughs> we're gonna bye youtube